Uh, before I read my statement, uh, I want to comment on what you said about Social Security and Medicare. And I'm not criticizing what you said. I'm going back to uh, uh, this comes up. Uh, why come you guys can't do something about saving Social Security and Medicare? And uh, I, did, I use history as an example. I always start out by saying, you know why nothing gets done in Washington, D.C. about Medicare and Social Security now? There's no Reagans and Tip O'Neills in this town anymore because they found uh, where we're going to be in uh, 10 years on these two programs, they were right there in 1983 or 84 or whenever it was. And uh, they raised taxes, they cut benefits, they changed formulas, and probably did a whole lot of other things that I don't remember. And, uh, and uh, they probably thought they were doing something for 20 years, I tell my constituents. But they did something for 50 years now, if we still go till 2033. And, uh, and uh, they did it because uh, they got together and said, you know, these programs are, so, I guess then they were only talking about Social Security. Social Security was so important, we can't let it go broke. And, uh, and they built up a surplus that we're still using of trillions and trillions of dollars and that's going to be spent down by 2033. And if we don't do something, uh, Social Security is going to be cut. It's going to be cut uh, by, uh, I guess, 23% or something. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm trying to, if there's any comment that I'm trying to make to you, it is that uh, they didn't just raise taxes. They got together in a program that was bipartisan and probably passed the Senate 90 to 10, and I voted for it. Well, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for agreeing to my request for today's hearing with Director Swagel. Uh, it's been nearly four years since the CBO director last testified before the Senate Budget Committee on the nation's budget outlook. Uh, that's far too long for what's traditionally been a routine occurrence in the Budget Committee, particularly given the budget hole we've dug ourselves into. Uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell stated earlier this year that it's, quote, past time to get back to an adult conversation about elected officials, about getting the federal government back on a sustainable path, uh, end of quotation. Today in the Budget Committee, that conversation is finally taking place. Director Swagel, thank you for coming. And I think you're going to tell each of us things that we'd rather not hear. But that's part and parcel of having what Paul called an adult conversation. So in moving beyond the partisan blame game of who's most at fault for our fiscal mess, President Biden tried to play this game at the recent presidential debate in an attempt to claim the mantle of fiscal responsibility. The reality is that President Biden has been dragged kicking and screaming to agree to even modest spending restraints as part of last year's Fiscal Responsibility Act. The fact is our nation's debt will soon top 35 trillion. Next year's interest payments will exceed $1 trillion and in 10 years, Social Security will go broke if we don't take bipartisan action to save it. I shouldn't say go broke because you're still going to have the revenue coming in that will pay 77% of what benefits are today. CBO has warned Congress for decades that we'd face a fiscal reckoning due to ballooning mandatory spending. That reckoning is now at our doorstep. Absent action, rising debt will leave future generations facing higher interest rates, lower incomes, greater inflation, and the risk of full-blown fiscal crisis. Avoiding this requires a robust discussion of revenue and spending. As I've said in previous hearings, I have a record of going after genuine tech 
loose loopholes and wasteful carve-outs, and I'm open to reviewing tax subsidies. Now, a very good place to start is with those in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which CBO has said actually increases inflation. Ending the law's subsidies for luxuries, luxury v EVs and other regressive giveaways that have exploded in cost could net hundreds of billions of savings. Contrary to claims from the left, taxing the so-called rich is no silver bullet to our fiscal outlook. Even confiscating, I want to emphasize confiscating, not taxing, all income over $1 million wouldn't close our $2 trillion deficit. History proves that high tax rates fail to raise significant revenue. So I'm repeating something I said here a couple meetings ago. Taxpayers and workers and investors are smarter than we are in the United States Senate because we've had 93 marginal tax rates, then 70% marginal tax rates, 50%, 30%, back up to 40%, and you can go on and on. But regardless of the rate, we've brought in about the same amount of revenue as you can see from this chart. So we ought to stop to think that we senators are not smarter than the taxpayers. Rather than punish success, tax reform should focus on incentivizing work, savings, and investment. And that's exactly what Federal Reserve Chairman Volcker advised Congress in the 1980s at a similar time of large deficits and inflation. It was a recipe for success then and can be a recipe for success at this point. Most importantly, we must have a frank discussion about Washington spending addiction. Whereas revenues are in line with historical levels, Federal spending relative to the size of our economy is at heights previously reserved for wars and recessions and still growing. Record spending is driving up unprecedented debt and deficits, which fuel more spending in the form of ballooning interest payments. Interest costs are rapidly becoming one of the largest line items in the federal budget. Next year, we'll see a new record as a share of gross, uh, a share of our economy. No single chart can capture the size and scope of our fiscal mess, but the closest to it is a depiction of federal relative to the size, the debt relative to the size of our economy. We're on track to set a new record high by 2027 exceeding the World War II era record. Well, debt to GDP rate, well, debt to GDP declined quickly after World War II. Today, our debt is infinitely projected to grow faster than the economy, and that's the definition of unsustainable. Yet, President Biden continues to use his pen and phone to spend trillions, particularly on student loan bailouts. In these unprecedented fiscal times, that's the height of recklessness. We must stop digging ourselves into an ever deep, deeper budget hole. And I think the budget agreement reached between McCarthy and uh, Biden a year ago uh, starts us down that track, maybe not as aggressively as we should, but is still a start. We must find common fiscal goals that can serve as a catalyst for that continuing that bipartisan action. Can we agree to debt to GDP can increase forever without consequences? Can we agree in a debt to GDP level that we mustn't cross? One last note. This week marks the 50th anniversary of the Congressional Budget Act, which created CBO and the Budget Committee. A lot has changed since 1974 from the way Congress operates to the size and scope of the federal budget. 
Updating the Budget Act for the fiscal 21 century is a, uh, a shared goal worth a shared goal worth continuing to work towards. So once again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this meeting, and welcome to you, Director Swagel.